Hey, Brian, thanks for being with us uh, for our uh, meeting here the 2nd of May. And uh, looks like you've got a, a mobile operation that uh, is uh, not to be compared. <laughs> How, how long have you been uh, working on this installation on your, uh, on your truck? Well, it started out in 2015, and then it's just pieced together ever since then. And then last month's the latest time I put something in. I put the rotor in to control it to your antenna. So, a rotary it, controller? Yeah. Oh, cool. So it's a, it's a constant fix. Is what it, yeah, you know how it is. It's a rabbit hole. Once you get going, you just get something else and go where you go. <laughs> so do you... Uh, do you actually get on the air while you're driving? Uh, on HF I do. HF? Try, yeah. Okay. Uh, my thing is talking long distance, low power. So that's, I try to just reach out as far as I can. Is well, that 20 meters or? Uh, 20, 40. That's what I usually stick at. 20, 10, sometimes 10. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. I know I like 17 meters. It's, 17. Uh, I've never done it. There's not a lot of activity on yeah. it, but it's a cool band. Yeah, I've never done 17 actually. Okay. I'll have to try it out though. So you got uh, lights and antennas, and how many radios do you have in your in your rig here? Uh, there's here? there's four. There's a 70 centimeter, two meter, then the 10 meter. Those are all dedicated, and then I have the HF rig. Okay. What, what HF rig do you use? It's the Kenwood 480 SAT. 480. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. So you've been uh, uh, operating this, or building this rig since uh, 2012? 2015. 2015, yeah. okay. Right. How long have you been a ham? Uh, 2013. 2013. I started with a two meter. Yeah, sure. My start was just to talk to the ISS, that was what okay. got me in. And that's that uh, yeah. antenna there. Well, three element beam. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the two meter that's on the pole now. Right. The 70 centimeters still hooked on the back of the truck. I didn't put it up. So. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's uh... Our own here in the BBRC. Just give a warm welcome to Jay Bromley. Thank you, Glenn. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I know there's new hams. Um, just if you don't mind, not trying to put you on the spot, but show me your hands, please. Great. Well, that's my first deal. Congratulations. Um, what are, are, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, point at her. Gotcha. Um, anybody interested in HF? Portable operating? I. And I'm, I'm looking back, this is going to be a very hard presentation because we really have some true greats in the hobby. I'm looking at Nick Kennedy back there that, uh, gosh, I guess, Nick, it's about 30 years since we've been doing this QRP thing, and you even beyond that. So um, how I got into doing this presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, but I um, was licensed in, like Glenn said, 1972. And it's been a wonderful ride. I've done everything backwards. Um, when I first got in the hobby, we were on 10 speeds. We had half a dozen kids riding the neighborhood, terrorizing anybody that had an antenna. Back then, if you had an antenna, you didn't worry about HOAs or covenants and restrictions or any of that stuff. In fact, if you had a big, shiny antenna, you were our fair game. We'd fly in like a bunch of wasps. So we had many Elmers over the years, um, and it's just been a great ride. Uh, in the mid-90s, uh, I got into QRP mainly to uh, minimize the TBI that I had running full power. Um, so that got me into the QRP realm of things. DXing followed that. And like I said, I've done everything backwards. Normally, you get a license, you get on the air, um, so on and so forth. So uh, I'm glad to see there's some people interested in HF. We're going to be aiming this more towards the new hams. Sorry for the slides. Me and my wife, by the way, argued about that last night. I said, I've been to BBRC, and it's going to be hard for them to see these colors. And she says, no, trust me on this. So,
let me ask these new guys, what's the most important part of your, uh, besides your license, you know, that, that was, uh, should have gave you all a big round of applause, but what's the most important part of an amateur radio station besides your license? Your Elmers have taught you well. <laughs> the antenna. I mean, I cannot stress this enough. When I taught New Hams down in Fort Smith, I would constantly bash them over the head. Antenna, antenna. Even my wife, that's all I talk about is antenna. Get in trouble about that too. Um, you can get on, if, if you have a, uh, well, let me just ask you this. What's the second most important thing? <laughs> if you, especially here in the summer. Good receiver. Good receiver. Anybody else? Line loss. Line loss. All good answers. The Elmer. I'm preaching to the new guys. Now, before you go and say, well, you've been a ham for 40 some odd years, I still get Elmer to to this day. As a matter of fact, I want to say thanks to Fred, K5QBX, Steve for uh, help set this up. I get Elmered by Steve. Uh, also, I want to say thanks to Ken before I go too much further, but this is Ken's magnetic loop, and we'll get more into this. There's my old ugly home brew thing. What's the best antenna? You guys have seen this presentation before. It reminds me of these guys right here. You know, if you get around a bunch of contesters at Dayton or DXers, this is what it reminds me of right here. The guy with the biggest mouth always wins. And by the way, let me say one thing about myself. I do not have a PhD behind my name. Me and my wife were talking about this. I don't even have a P behind my name. She says most of the time I have a BS. <laughs> so please take all this with a grain of salt. So let's go over some pros of various antennas. And again, we're going to be stressing this towards friendly operating, fun, portable, get out and then breathe some fresh air for a change. Although, as you can tell from my hoarseness, uh, this isn't the time of year really to do that, but um, magnetic loop. If you look at this, this one isn't too portable, you know, it's, I've got a used um, camera tripod, shop vac, uh, vacuum cleaner hoses, this is LMR 400, a vacuum variable, um, where Ken's is nice and pretty. It's it's, and it works good. So there's two different examples right there. Um, HOA friendly. How many of y'all live in an HOA? POA. POA, okay. Well, Kathy was working up here in uh, Northwest Arkansas for five years. And I kept saying, the heck with ham radio. I just want to move up here. The kids had left, the dog had died, and I was stuck in Fort Smith all by myself. So, you know, th this HOA stuff is real. Um, it's really sad that we have to go through it. Um, and even the ham radio operators, some of them are believers in HOA. It's hard to believe, hard for me to believe. And your opinion on HOA views depends on your situation and probably situations in the past. Um, no supports. Actually, I could have condensed this down and you'll actually see magnetic loops that will have just a base on them. It can be a piece of plywood. Um, you don't have to have a tripod. Um, these things can have, now, there's a, quite a bit of debate on transmitting loops, whether they have a great front to side. And you might ask yourself, we'll get a little bit more into this, but as Fred's walking off, the signal of that magnetic loop is going that way, that way and this way. 
Um, you can turn it. There is some directionality. Um, we'll get more on that in a minute with receiving loops. But there is a null. It's very pronounced. But the neat thing about the mag loops is they're, the current flows pretty much all over. Um, there's a little bit of a null, not, not a great deal. Uh, low noise. Because these things, and Fred saw this real quick, you can just breathe on this capacitor. And one of the things that I would do is put a reduction drive, maybe a five to one, so you just barely touch. Oh, it's turned up. You all hear that? That's just how touch, that's not even the, maybe an eighth of an inch or less. And um, if you got here earlier, we were playing with it on 30 and 20 and stuff like that. So, I mean, considering that we're in a, indoors, in fact, when I built this, I hung it up on a light fixture like that in my room. I was playing with uh, the uh, air variable and guy was calling CQ on 40. Now, efficiency wise, you're down in the single percent on 40 with these things. <clears throat> Um, however, you get on the higher bands like 20 and 15, the efficiency can go up close to a dipole. Uh, can be used uh, low to the ground with good results. That's an advantage. Uh oh, I'm hitting the, uh, the scroll wheel. Sorry about that. Now this thing here can perform or can outperform other antennas that are low to the ground, including a 20 meter beam at 30 feet. Now think about that for a minute. Would I get, and I'm gonna pick on all these antennas uh, through the course of the night. So if your favorite antenna, I'm picking on it, don't get too upset because I'm gonna play devil's advocate. I'm gonna step over here and I'm gonna trash the mag loop eventually. Um, there is no perfect antenna. It's what is good for you and your situation and what you're trying to do. Dipoles. Everybody knows what a dipole is. They take, you know, it should be on your test. Dipole is simple to build. Um, wider bandwidth. By the way, <clears throat> let's discuss bandwidth for just a minute. On 80 meters, these mobile antennas and stuff, they may have like 20 KCs. And you gotta retune. That's why you see these motorized screwdriver antennas. Same way with these loops. If you get the Q or the quality, which that loop, uh, let me go over here, get my train of thought. This loop is an, it looks like an inductor to the outside world and the Q, the higher, and Q stands for quality, but the higher the Q, the sharper the tuning, the narrower the bandwidth, the lower the noise. Now, with all things like antennas especially, uh, that's a controversial subject right there. But it stands to reason if you're, you know, having a very narrow bandwidth to a point where you can actually saw off part of your sideband signal. I've seen some loops do this. So when you're operating digital with these magnetic loops and you're looking 4KC out on FT8, you gotta watch who you're going after. You go up to say 3600, maybe out of the pass band if you tuned at zero. Inexpensive. Dipoles are inexpensive. Go to Lowe's, you can build one for hardly nothing. Although copper has gone up. Um, can be portable as long as you have tree supports. What do I mean by tree supports? Well, when you go out QRPing or portable operating, or even at your house, you need a launcher. Now, when you get older, you don't have things like uh, the arm that we used to have. So, in my little box of tricks, use a, a fishing reel like this. Just lay it on the ground, or if you're 
it, lucky in my case, I give it to Kathy and say, hold that. And by the way, this is called a hyper dog launcher. It's made to have fun with your dog. So you can go buy this thing with the excuse that, hey, I'm going to go play with Comet or whoever. And then when the wife's back's turned, you can use it for your antennas. So what you'll do with this thing, you'll use an ordinary tennis ball. You'll rig it up something like this. You'll launch this thing over the uh, tree or whatever support you want, and then pull it back through with a stronger line. Now, I'm not going to pull this back too far because it's been around for a while. It's dry rotted. I'd luck out and it'd probably break and hit me in the face. But um, if you get into this style of shooting, which I tend to enjoy but for a lot of reasons, I don't have to carry much stuff around with me. Tell Kathy to carry the rest and you just pull it back like this and let her rip. Um, speaking of which, if you've looked at any beam flipper on YouTube, notice they don't go like this. They shoot it sideways and it's like a bow and arrow, so to speak, or a 45 degree angle. Now, I always try and get in safety. <sighs> this could hurt, even though it's a tennis ball. Um, would it kill you? Probably not. But, here's what happened. Guys have been cutting slits and putting pennies in these things, or BBs, and they call them rattlers, and they've even gone so far as to say, well, you need 10 pennies for a weight. Well, that could become a, in fact, in some localities, this is considered a weapon. You know, I was a little hesitant to bring it, but, you know, be very careful especially if you're in the city. Um, I would not be using lead weights. They do sell models that use lead weights. And let me tell you something, the disadvantage of a lead weight is that it will go over the tree limb, wind around, and then you just have to break the, the wire. There is another alternative to all this. Remember the old super balls that we grew up with? Just drill you a hole through it. This is plenty solid enough, but I guarantee you don't leave this around with your grandkids and let them see it. You cock this back with the Super Bowl and let it rip, it's going to hurt. So safety first, so. Yeah, it's, but you know, um, this for fun, the Hyper Dog, and I even wrote an article on these silly launchers years ago. They're good for about 40 feet, pretty good. In fact, they even make a man-sized version of this where you can stick stakes in the ground and you're using your whole body. And I forgot what they call those things, people launchers. Um, and I'm sorry to get off the subject a little bit, but there are other alternatives. Say hello to my little friend, Mr. Spud Gun. Now, I used to have a QRP buddy named Tom. First saw this at Flagstaff, Arizona at Fort Tuhill. And I had a good friend of mine build this one for me, um, WB5AAA, Jim. And I have Spud, will travel. There is no tree that I could not conquer down in Fort Smith, including 80 and 90 foot pine trees. Again, I have to stress, safety first. The reason why I mention this is I had some fellow co-workers down in Fort Smith. We were talking about this one day. They were non-hams, but they thought this was a cool thing. And even after you launch the device, a lot of times there's enough of a charge where it'll go choo. They decided that it was a good idea to put a beer can down this and see if it would project the beer can. They got it stuck. Well, they just decided they would increase the air pressure. It went through one deal of sheetrock and all the way through the roof and shingles. 
Um, this could this could potentially kill, but you know if you've got a and I and I'm unlucky in that I do not have pine trees in my yard. I'm looking at them across the street, and every day I think, man, I'd love to have that tree. But you also on the spud gun, you just you know the reason why I call it spud guns. They used to put potatoes in here, and instead of uh, compressed air. They used to use uh, white rain hairspray and you'd take a little cigarette lighter or something and boom, it'd launch spuds, potato spuds. But you've got the little thing to, you know, charge the thing down with your favorite tennis ball. So I just wanted to bring this to show you that, um, yeah, there's guys that can take a water jug, some string, and they can throw this thing around and they can throw it over the tree, but getting back to the pro, uh, I love dipos. I think they can be used very portable, but you know, let's face it. What do you do if you're going up on, on hiking up on rocks and stuff? Um, we live in an area, you know, where the, we're lucky if we can survive these tornadoes. So you don't have a lot of big trees. Uh, let's talk about beams a minute. Everybody know what a beam is? Good. They got game. Look, there's, there's uh, guys out there on these magnetic loops. They're great antennas. They have their faults. They have their pros and stuff. But you cannot beat game. Um, imagine if I had a balloon and I squeeze that balloon and one side starts coming out towards you. We're just redirecting that energy on the beam. You're not actually gaining anything. Um, beams are great for DXing. Ego booster. My beam's bigger than your beam. <laughs> okay, let's talk about cons. On the magnetic loop, oh man, I can't even see that. Oh. Right. Safety, safety uh, beware. These things generate and can generate high current and high voltage. You, I mean, like for example, I think um, QRP levels 100 watts or less, you're talking about tens of amps. Um, you're talking about legal power. I've seen guys use vacuum variables that are rated at 15 kV to 30 kV. Talking, I mean, in fact, I just thought, well, one day I wonder how much this, this thing will take. Well, the capacitor took it fine and everything. I got up to 30 watts and it started doing the SWR thing. I could feel heat coming off the, the LMR. So, and we'll talk more about that. I'm watching the time. I'm going to start speeding things up. Um, need low loss conductors. Vacuum variable capacitor preferred. Narrow bandwidth, also a pro. It's a disadvantage in that you blink an eyeball and your rig's off frequency. Now I'm listening to Fred over there right now copying some CW, but if I were just to bump that a little bit, you'd just be hearing the same thing as being plugged in a dummy load. Uh, dipos. Uh, portability difficult without supports, aka trees, and a launcher. Not HOA friendly. Think about this, 160 meter dipo is what, 250 feet long at least? Most yards are not quite that conducive. There's tricks you can do, sure. Also, dipos need to be a minimum of quarter wavelength. If you get on the BBRC net, that means around 66 feet, you know, for decent local coverage. If you're going after DX, maybe 100 plus feet. Susceptible to atmospheric noise. Wider bandwidth, so you don't have to tune as often. Beams, expensive. Generally not portable. Needs to be up at least a half wave. That's around 64 plus feet again, between 60 and 70 feet. Magnetic loop can equal the performance, and I did this again, of a 20 meter beam at 30 feet. So, 
How many of y'all got hex beams? Nobody has a hex beam? Ah, oh, Steve. Used to. Now, I'm not going to pick on this hex beam, but how can that be? Hex beam is a two element beam that's got gain. Well, again, the radiation from this loop is going very low angles, but it's constant. Well, it, if notice the 30 feet thing. Your, your takeoff angle of your beam may be taken off in a different way, and then this guy down the street from you comes on with one of these antennas and beats you out. And this happens all the time. Would I give up a hex beam for a magnetic loop at my house? No. No way, no how. By the way, <clears throat> where's the magic in this? If, if you look at this, you've got an electrical field, and 90 degrees from this, the, when you transmit, you make an electromagnetic wave, and they're 90 degrees apart from each other. So you've got the magnetic part of the wave and the electric part. Guess which part the power line noise comes from? The E, the electrical, where the magnetic field seems to be oblivious to this sort of thing. What turns an antenna into a uh, uh, magnetic loop anyway? I mean, couldn't we just build this loop? Oh, let's see. On 75 meters, that would be... Uh, 250 feet or somewhere right around there. Did I get it right, Nick? Um, we're talking a lot of space. Things change when you go uh, to this magic 0.1 to 0.15 wavelength. That's what make, turns it into a magnetic loop. When you get big, it changes into an E antenna. I have to really watch this because you get this sort of with all this terminology and stuff. Um, by the way, if you look up magnetic loop on Google, you'll come up with right at nine million hits. Just for fun, I typed in antenna expert. It came up with zero. No, not really. Actually, it was some outrageous number, 29 million. Now folks, I don't know how many hams are in the world, but to have 29 million hits for antenna experts, which I am not, that just seems to be a little obscene to me. Um, but my mind works funny anyway. Uh, getting back to 20 meters, full size loop would be around 66 feet. Magnetic loop, around 6 feet in diameter which is about 10 feet long. <coughs> Give or take a few. Don't get hung up in all this, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. Try some of this stuff. Just sit in the floor in the garage and play with some of this stuff. The coupling loop, what are we talking about? Here's the coupling loop right here. This is what it cites the magnetic loop over here. Instead of a big fancy coaxial Faraday loop, I've just got a wire. It could have been a copper strap. It could have been anything, almost. Coat hanger. In fact, on some bands, it'll look like a coat hanger when you adjust it for the lowest SWR. So say you build a loop and you measure it out and it's 10 feet long. You need the coupling around two feet. Simple. Take what you got in your junk box and just give it a shot. Take a capacitor. If it doesn't work, try something else. Uh, these gain figures I stole off the web. Talk about gain. DBI. Oh, man. Used to be, decades ago, the ARRL banned gain figures from antennas because they were constantly that arm wrestling deal. My antenna beat yours out by a quarter of a, a dB. Well, 
if this was a perfect antenna or one of these light bulbs without the base and it was illuminating all the way around, that's an isotropic source. That's what these things are. It's an imaginary figure, but anyway, just for the sake of argument, you got 1.5 dBi dipole has 2 dBi and the beam, I think that's a little low. It should be probably around, even if you put it at 9. Guess what? S meter wise, if you're at S9, you're only going to be an S meter down on your magnetic loop. If you've got a hex beam up and you're S9 talking to wherever, and I come along at the same place, low to the ground, I'm going to be within a couple S units as long as you have a good quality loop. And he has maybe a bad quality beam. By the way, nothing magical about a beam. It's just got a reflector. They call this the dipole, but it's actually the driven element. And then the director. What you're doing, you're blocking the wave here, and the director is pulling it. Is it perfect? No. There's still stuff that leaks out the back and the side. Also, on this dipole here, you can actually see the E wave, not the magnetic wave, but the E wave changing, and also the wave up and down the dipole antenna. Let's talk about some commercial uh, magnetic loop antennas. My Italian friends need to help me out here. Ciro Mazzoni? Okay. Ciro? Yeah. Close enough. Well, well, we'll show some more about them in a minute. But these are the commercial prices. Now, DX Engineering has these on sale for this month only. 2000 bucks or a little more. Regularly 2500 The Alex loop depends. You know, I can't just say, you know, notice that we got around 400 bucks. Now, the Alex, by the way, the Alex loop started all this, really, in the QRP world. If you want to have a lot of fun and see things like homebrew capacitors with beer cans and uh, hydraulic syringes to actuate the capacitor, get on... Alex Loop's page. Uh, it's very entertaining, if nothing else. Um, Kathy's friend Alpha Antennas, which is this design, around 500 chameleon, which is popular with the preppers. We have any preppers here? We all know what preppers are. Are they an alien? Um, you'd be surprised there are a lot of preppers that are getting into this type of antenna. Um, I'm not sure quite why. Uh, how much would it cost? That one cost us 20 bucks with a good junk box. If you raid your buddies, probably less. Uh, the heart of the loop, that's the tuning capacitor. That's the almighty of a transmitting loop. That in minimizing the losses. On mine, I did a little trick here. The stationary plates are called the rotor. The thing that turns, I'm sorry, the stator, excuse me. The thing that turns is called the rotor. Um, you knew hams. What's a capacitor? They showed you two plates. Well, if these were two metal plates, and you put them together and separated them just a little bit, you got a capacitor. So, I've seen guys build their own capacitors out of a bunch of coax parallel together. They just calculate it out, and it makes a darn, if you're making it out of Teflon cable, it makes a darn good capacitor. Uh, the butterfly, uh, just a different design, but the idea is you've got more capacitance because of the butterfly action on, on both the top and the bottom. But the main capacitor you want to use if you want the ultimate, now there's a rotor of the butterfly, is the vacuum variable. Here's the problem. Vacuum variables, even if you get them from Russia, are around 100 to 200 bucks on eBay. 
Uh, if you scrap out a piece of military gear, you might get it for free. Or like one of my neighbors did, he said, can you use this? <laughs> and I looked inside the box. It came from the uh, airport. had a vacuum bearable in it, a 500 puff vacuum bearable. He gives it to me. Plus it had a bunch of doorknobs. Another design. Here's your Ciro Marzoni or however you pronounce it. That's their capacitor. I'll have some more screenshots of that. But that thing is huge. Just imagine two metal plates moving towards each other but they're separated by air. There's a problem. Now notice this guy here. <laughs> he's got this monstrous tower, but he's got one of those $2,500 antennas. And the reason why I took that picture, I wanted to show you, and of course it's washed out, but I wanted to show you the capacitor plates moving and closing. Now here's the problem. Those things, you can use aluminum. People think, well, aluminum's higher loss than copper. That is true but you're only going like down 2.5 mils on aluminum. So you can use aluminum, but here's the problem. You're moving at least one arm. One arm is stationary. There's a bolt that goes through. And I've looked, and it's funny how these loop manufacturers, they don't want you to see what's inside the black box. They don't want you to see how they're moving this actuating arm because most people that know anything about loops think, oh man, there's big loss there. That could flame out. You know, you could get up to maybe 90 amps. Now that I talked about the beam ego, well, now we got the loop ego. Um, this will work on 160 just from the sheer size of it. Um, this is a monster. Now, in all fairness, probably by the time you TIG or Heliarc all this stuff, it's going to be worth the $2,500 bucks you pay for it. Uh, but that's beyond my pay grade. Another loop design called the Fractal. What's the deal here? Well, we're just trying to get more... Yeah, exactly. Just trying to get more surface area so you can get on the lower bands. Like, you know, if you live in a city lot and you're wanting to get on 80 or 160, what do you do? Well, you add a turn. That's one way of doing it. In fact, most of these commercial loop things, they'll sell you a nice device that says add on, 100 bucks, and they're just extending the loop to a second loop. I've actually seen one of these work at the uh, um, St. Louis QRP. Bicycle rim. I thought this was horrible because there's no way you can get the losses down. But I was wrong. 2.5 mils. These rims are thick. So the skin area of the RF is not going too deep. Notice how he built his uh, capacitor. Two pieces of circuit board. All it is is two plates. And he's trimmed them and he's, that's just a six meter loop only. It's not trying to cover multiple bands. Also notice, if you can see this, his loop is not circle, it's oblong. <coughs> Don't get hung up on aesthetics. Make it work first. Actually, a lot of guys, and I don't know the theory of this, but they actually claim that there's more uh, energy when you oblong that coupling loop. Um, need to quickly talk about receive antennas, active receive antennas that are magnetic loops because they're a totally different bird. Here's a picture of one in a guy's attic. Uh, like the transmitting loop, the heart of it was the capacitor and the receiving loop, it's the preamp. The preamp, the preamp, the preamp. DX Engineering bought out Pixel Loop you cannot get a schematic for it. They are scared to death you're going to run over to China and have it duplicated. Um, they're also low noise, same way. But here's 
the big kicker, their wide bandwidth. What's wide bandwidth? Blow the broadcast band to 30 megahertz with no tuning, but it's just a receive only. Now there, is this a perfect antenna? No. The DX and, DXer and contesters on 160 probably wouldn't be caught dead with one, but if you're just talking to your buddy in Texas, they're great. Plus, if you like tuning the AM broadcast band and seeing what all you can hear, you'd be surprised. You can turn this thing 90 degrees and hear a totally different AM station. I'm sorry, I'm going long. Um, Here's some commercial versions of this. But again, don't let this stop you from trying to build one of your own. There's tons of, like this guy here, he started out just building a piece of crap like this, and then he starts selling it on eBay. And he sells kits on eBay. He both transmit and receiving. The well, Wellbrook, that's a UK deal. That's very popular among SWLers, so if you just like to listen, the Pixel 525 through DX Engineering, but they do work. When you go to a flex booth at Hamcom or Dayton or whatever, and they're showing that pan adapter and all that fancy gizmo, guess what they're running? They're either remoting in or they're using a Pixel loop for receive on the deal. The, these convention centers are some of the most noisy places I've ever seen. That's the Pixel loop, and you might ask, well, what's so great about it? It's 38 inches in diameter. It's made out of aluminum conduit, more or less. And here's your preamp. Now you might ask, uh, well, if I'm transmitting on another antenna, isn't it going to blow that preamp up? They have a bias box, and it turns the preamp off. And that's it. Any? Appreciate it. It's hard for me to, these cameras really mess me up. <laughs> Any questions? Go ahead. Uh, you said that little loop up there is called the exciter? Well, it's a coupling loop. Okay. Um, so it, are the, are the, is the LMR, is that passive or, or what, how's that? I'm, I'm, it, I'm it's a, this is, like if I'm aiming the LMR 400 at you, me. yeah. Wow. But now there is a, with everything you say, and a layman like me would say, when I say it depends, that means I don't know. Um, but with everything in life, there is a trade-off. Like, if you model this, it's going to be pretty good on all directions, but there will be a slight null. Now, what gets you in trouble is, with the DXers and contesters on the lower bands, is you've got signals coming at different angles that hit the ground and upset this magnetic relationship. Um, so, are, is the magnetic loop really magic? No. It's just like when the, uh, the hex beam came out. I can remember people calling that a quad. It's not a quad, it's a two element beam. And there was nothing magical about the hex antenna other than it fit a small footprint and did a great job. Um, speaking of uh, salesmanship and snake oil, for you new guys, not the old guys, but when you're shopping for antennas, I had a uh, close friend that I elmered in Fort Smith, and as soon as he was able to get his license, he popped open a QST and he said, what do you think about a Cushcraft R7? Or... Um, the best ones that I like to talk about are dipoles, wire antennas. You got the double bazooka. You got the off-center fed. You got dipoles. And guess what, guys? Yeah, they, they may have some advantages, like the off-center fed may be resonant on several bands. The double bazooka may be broadbander. But given the same height, then um, they're all going to radiate the same. So don't get caught up on this super cobra snake antenna because, I mean, I've got a baggy sealer at home. I used to produce some QRP kits, and, 
and literally you could get uh, some boards out, nail your stuff, get a good crimper. You could go in the antenna business and trust me, you call it a, a super snake name, especially, or something fantastic like blowtorch or, you know, um, you will get people swearing by it because they'll put it in a slightly different area and if they got an antenna switch box, that antenna may actually in some instances show a little more gain. Like if you're low to the ground and we didn't talk about NVIS, but like if you, there is a set of antennas called near vertical incident wave antennas. You get low to the ground, they shoot straight up and you can enhance that. Um, so if you're talking to some guy over in Oklahoma, he says, man, I've never heard you this strong. Well, he's probably telling you the truth. Um, but you get your antenna up as high as you possibly can. Overall, you're going to be more pleased with it. Did you say that had a low or a high takeoff angle, the, the magnetic boost? It's got a little bit of everything. Uh, that's what makes it neat. It's on the magnetic plane. But since it does, since the lobe is spread out, you don't have as much gain. So it's, it's no free lunch, guys. Like if you're squirting stuff out, let's just say I put a light bulb, and there's people on YouTube that take little LEDs or light bulbs, and they'll show you the current distribution in this. It's pretty equal. Um, but it's because it's equal, you're not going to be having this massive gain like a beam antenna would. Um, surprised I didn't get any questions about the spud. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. It depends. <laughs> uh, actually, it. Do I have to go into this? Uh, yeah, well, I mean. You might as well tell us all. Yeah. <laughs> Is it ham or baloney? Well, it's it actually. Like I said, it depend, receiving or transmitting, let me ask you that. Transmitting, it's vertical. Um, and I really don't remember, to be honest, if, as you're coming down, whether it likes the horizontal side or the vertical. Again, it depends on a lot of rotation and stuff like that. Steve or Nick, do you all? It likes to receive vertical a little better. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And again, your Elmers, some of the best in the business, are right here on the corners. And where'd Fred go? There. Mm -hmm. Can we work somebody on it? Huh? Can Fred work somebody on it? Here. Uh, he probably could. Um, I made the comment to somebody here, and I don't remember who it was. Uh, we were listening to people, so I'm assuming that we could probably talk to somebody. Usually if you can hear them, um, in the QRP world, which that's what we're using, if they're S9 and they're running power, you can probably work them. But if they're running power and you're running QRP level, when you get down towards the S5, that gets iffy unless you're running FT8. I made a comment that um, if you sent a signal on a light bulb long enough, somebody would answer you. And the reason why I'm saying that is, is that we... Um, a friend of mine in the QRP world and I, he holds a record for million, mi million miles per watt. So we were going to set a record on 30 meters. He sends me a precision attenuator, and this got to be sort of heated like the arm wrestling thing. And it got to be a badge of honor because it was actually in a book. And so he says, hey, Jay, do you want to try 30 meters with me. I said, yeah, man, this will be cool. We'll break some records. Well, the attenuator was surface mount. I burned out the first resistor without knowing it. And so what we would do, we would set up like a beacon that would run nonstop. And so he would listen when he could all day, if he could on the weekends, and he would find out if he could hear or not. Now, that's not the end of this story. We did not set the record. But after two weeks of leaving that beacon on, 
I get a note from W5OX, I think was his call. And he says, why are you running this code word called rows? And what we would do is we would pick a word out of nowhere and if the guy copied the word, we knew that we could probably set that record. So here I'm transmitting into a complete open and no telling how much attenuation and I was running down in the milliwatts and I was heard. Uh, it wasn't very far, it was in El Paso, but just the fact of the matter that the guy was able to hear me was astronomical. That's what makes QRP so much fun. I mean, you, you really... Um, yeah, Fred? I was just, just sitting here a while ago when you were turning this thing around, there was a AA7FV and a VE1AXJ. <coughs> VE1, do you know where that's at, right? Uh, yeah. In Newfoundland? Yeah. <laughs> that we've received right here on this antenna. On what band? 30 still? 30. Yeah. And, and I took the plate off. The plate I don't think is uh, magnetic or uh, aluminum, but it did seem to upset Fred a little bit um, <laughs> on, his, on his measurements. But everybody, when Ron first saw this presentation, which I've really changed it up, um, they wanted to come over and look inside it because there's been some guys that have built their own loops here. And they want to compare. Um, one thing I didn't discuss, what would I do differently? Yeah, exactly. This, this LMR 400 would have to go in the trash bin. <coughs> I, you know, I mean, seriously, it's, it's great jumper, but I would make this out of uh, copper, superflex, anything. I mean, if you're showing heat at 30 watts, heat that you can feel, there's something wrong, folks. That's how many amps are going through this thing. Second thing I'd probably change, I'd experiment with more of a Faraday shield, although some people say that there's no difference. I don't know. That's why you experiment. Um, I would probably do away with this toggle switch uh, because that's another source of loss. And even though I've got Teflon wiring, silver plated and silver bearing wire, I would probably improve the capacitor. It might go to a vacuum variable. Uh, would I do it for a portable operation? No. I mean, it was amazing. Ken's uh, Alpha uh, mag loop, he was receiving people on 40 meters and it was just loud. Um, so, you know, Ken was telling me that it's just fun to go out on the balcony. Well, you know, you don't have to go hiking down a trail or um, hike up Mount Hermon like um, uh, G, uh, WG0AT does with his goats, um, you can just go to your balcony or your backyard and have a ton of fun. I, I know you, yes, Steve. you want to use QRP and five watts right. is probably a good thing, but what, what will like yours there, what would you run on 30? You know? Right now, I probably would run more than 20 watts to be honest, just because of the heat, but the Ciro, um, Barzoni, or however you pronounce it, and I'm sure it's wrong, when I go to Dayton this year, I'll probably go up to the booth and ask them how to pronounce it. It took me a long time to learn Bengali that makes the keys. But, you know, those things are made to run full power. I mean, full power. But that 2500 bucks that you would spend, our military's probably spending a lot more. And that joint that I was talking about that's moving, I noticed, uh, and it's, it's hard to get details, but they have like straps in addition to all this reinforcement. So when you, it's like with everything else, uh, when you shoot the power up, things have to be more robust, more precise, but then when you turn the power down, it's going to work even better. Uh, the power will show you your faults. Um, and in a mag loops case, it doesn't take much because you're talking about uh, many KVs and many amps. I'm talking hundreds of amps at times. Um, and that's another safety reason. You know, like if anything else you've learned about the launchers, these things to operate safety at 100 watts you'd probably want to get at least two diameters from it. 
Um, which is kind of silly because when I was sitting in the floor, my head was stuck in it and I'm adjusting it. Um, <laughs> they, they, I didn't hear you. He said that explains a lot. Yeah, it does. It really does. Plus, you know, I take an allergy pill before I get here and I'm just spastic right now. So it took me a while to go, yes, Steve? Have you ever run one of these horizontal? I, I've always been meaning to do that, and I never have done it. My understanding is you have to run them higher. Higher, yes. Uh, you got it. wonder if you've tried that. I have not. MFJ, uh, there was a contester in the Caribbean that took down one of the MFJs, but he put it on a 90-foot tower. And <laughs> there are some guys that, um, this is a funny uh, story, but I won't tell you the end result. But there is a receiving loop that's horizontal called the Waller, the end all walls. The Waller antenna, just look it up on Google. They claim that that is the secret to the Waller's success. I happened to go on a top secret mission with K5GO in Harrison and I was not impressed with the Waller performance. Um, but we were just playing out in the field with another friend and um, you know, antennas are fun to play with. Um, and I learned a lot that day just from hanging around those guys. And then later on, um, Stan brings by a three element receiving array and we deploy it out in the rain, pouring down rain, and test it. And he's eventually going to take it to Cayman Brock. Now, that's where you get into this depend stuff. These guys with these uh, four, five, up to nine element receiving vertical arrays. Um, they claim that's as, that would be like being on 20 meters with a five element beam. That's hard for me to imagine. But that's what they say it's equivalent to being behind that. Also, um, we could talk hours just on active receiving antennas on end, but the the bottom line is the preamp if or active preamp if you're not going to use radials. But a lot of guys will say, well, I've got to buy a preamp because, yeah, my signal to noise has gotten better, but the S meter's not swinging. You know, you don't have to get all hung up about the S meter. If you're here in the station and he's S5 and you've got no noise, what's better? S9 with S7 noise? Or hearing in the clear, you know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, we're way over time. Uh, anybody else? Well, thank you for putting up with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>